asistir a una conferencia del profesor Gibbs. Welcome to the Faculty of Physics and thank you very much, Professor Gibbs, for participating in this series of conferences. Y por mi parte también dar las gracias al profesor Scholz, al profesor Parrondo, que son quienes han organizado esta charla. Muchísimas gracias y quienes también van a presentar al conferenciante. Así es que, profesor Scholz, por favor. Muchas gracias, Marisa, por la introducción. Uh, well, for me it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Andrew Briggs from Oxford University to, to the audience of the Universidad Complutense. Uh, he, he did his PhD at the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge University and then was a postdoc of the Royal Society. And then in 2002, I think, he became the first professor, the first holder of the nanomaterials uh, chair in, at Oxford University. And since then, his interest in research spins around nanomaterials, uh, nanotechnology, but also about fundamental questions. Uh, he, he has, um, uh, he has uh, received a number of, uh, of awards, and, he's, uh, and he has uh, also several major responsibilities. Like, for instance, he has been the coordinator of a, of a major a network of uh, a pro a major program in the UK about uh, uh, nanoscience research. He has 600 publications with over, which have collected over 22,000 citations. And uh, he's, uh, he, also, he also has an interest in philosophy and theology. He has a degree in theology. And his interest in philosophy has somehow helped uh, uh, him go towards uh, fundamental questions of uh, physics in his research. So he uses now technology not only to do very nice conventional research, which eventually can have applications, but he also uses to test fundamental questions of quantum physics, and that's a part of the things he will talk about today. Uh, he has recently written a book uh, about the history of science and its relation to philosophy and theology, which is called The Penalty the Curiosity, and has been translated into Spanish, and it was presented at IKE yesterday. Okay, there is a Spanish translation. And, Okay, he, he will talk about uh, questions of nanoscience, but mostly focused towards the, the study of uh, fundamental questions of quantum mechanics, such as the violation of classical inequalities uh, and related things. So I, I, it's a pleasure. I, I welcome Professor Biggs, and I give you the floor. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed <clears throat> for your welcome. It is a huge privilege to be here. And uh, I want to talk today about some of the new prospects for experimental nanoscience that are becoming available. And uh, later on in the talk, I'll, I'll talk about new ways that we might be able to test concepts in non-equilibrium thermodynamics and how we might extend them to the quantum regime. But uh, I'll start off by talking a little bit about some of the foundations. Two weeks ago, I was in... Uh, uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, celebrating the 80th birthday of Sir Anthony Leggett. He was a, an Oxford undergraduate. He studied classics at Oxford, Latin and Greek philosophers. And then after he'd graduated, he started to learn quantum theory. He got good enough at it to win the Nobel Prize in the quantum theory of cold matter but he's never lost his original interest in the rigorous philosophy. And um, over, well, 30 years ago, uh, he wrote a paper where he, he said, this is, this is a rather difficult lecture theater to speak in because here is the speaker, I can neither see the slides nor the clock, and you can see both. So I'll try to uh, tell you what the slides say and I'll also try to keep to time. But um, he, he, he was explaining the problem that despite 60 years of schooling in quantum mechanics, most physicists today have a very non-quantum mechanical notion of reality at the macroscopic level. And in a footnote, uh, he uh, gave a, a couple of exceptions to that. But then he said um, in the footnote, you know, we strongly suspect that the number of physicists who in fact genuinely adhere to either of these interpretations, which are the, the, uh, the many worlds interpretation and the sort of reduction by consciousness interpretation, uh, we strongly suspect the number of physicists who really adhere to them 
is considerably less than the number who claim to. And in a moment, I'll tell you what that macroscopic uh, notion of reality is. But let me just illustrate this other point first of all, and, and uh, I guess everybody here has heard of um, uh, the Schrodinger cat experiment that was actually devised by Erwin Schrodinger when he was living in Oxford, and he was living in the same road that I now live in myself. He had a cat called a Milton, and uh, it's prompted this cartoon, which is about your cat, Mr. Schrodinger. I have good news, and I have bad news. <laughs> and uh, there, in fact, is the, um, the uh, Spanish edition of the penultimate curiosity, which was published here last year. And if you missed the presentation yesterday, uh, Professor Sols was kind enough to come to it, there will be a showing at 5.30 today of uh, the documentary film that uh, Roger Wagner and I made after we'd written the book. And that's at 5.30, so I promise I'll finish in good time before that this afternoon. Now, um, 20 years after he'd uh, published that first paper, which I'll come back to in a moment, Tony Leggett said, look, you can, you can think of... Um, reactions to this, this problem in three broad, broad classes. One is that quantum mechanics is the complete truth about the physical world and it describes a reality. The second one is that it's the complete truth but it does not describe a reality. And the third one is that it's the complete truth uh, at the tiny level but it's not the complete truth at uh, larger scales and, and some different principle may intervene. And he rather interestingly, he said uh, later in the paper, personally, if I could be sure that we'll forever regard quantum mechanics as the complete truth, then I should grit my teeth and plump for option B, but making it clear that he doesn't like it very much. And uh, because of his rigorous background in uh, philosophy combined with his uh, mathematical description of quantum theory, he came up with a very precise notion of reality at the macroscopic level and an inequality that you could actually use to test it. So the definition is this, that uh, reality at the macroscopic level, he said, let's define it as the conjunction of two beliefs. One is that at any moment a system is in one of its available states and the second one is we can find out which without affecting the history either the subsequent history or indeed the, the retrocausal history and for simplicity we'll think of a two-level system and we'll let one level be plus one and the other level be minus one and then he said um, you can, you can write down the sum of some correlations. The correlations between the state at time one and at time two, the correlation between the state at time two and time three, and the correlation between the state at time one and time three. And you can write down that expression. There are different ways to write it down, but in the form I've written it there, if the first two uh, postulates hold, then you can very quickly work out for yourself that that function cannot be less than zero. So it must be a zero or positive number. For 25 years, no one could think of how to do a test that satisfied the very stringent requirements of this. It's actually extremely difficult to fulfill those requirements. And uh, in 2009, I was coming to the end of running the, the National Quantum Information Processing Activity in the UK, which actually subsequently subs followed by, by another 270 million of government funding in quantum information processing. It was a very successful program. But I was in Santa Barbara wondering what to do next and found myself thinking about this, and in particular the connection between the spins that at the time we were measuring a lot in the laboratory, electron spins. And uh, I came up with a way of, of testing it, and so at the, around about the same time did other people with different tests, but Tony Leggett said that ours was the only one that he really found satisfactory. Um, 
where the system was the spin of a phosphorus impurity atom in silicon and then we had an ancilla which was the spin of the electron associated with that phosphorus atom and the phosphorus atoms in the sample were far enough apart that you could neglect interactions between them on the time scale of the experiment and the way that we devised so you know spin up was plus one spin down was minus one of the uh, phosphorus nucleus and the way that we devised of doing a, a, a non-invasive measurement was to say we'll let the um, we'll do a controlled knot between the spin on the phosphorus uh, nucleus and the spin on the phosphorus electron and if the electron spin flips then uh, that was an invasive measurement and we discard that but if the electron spin does not flip in the controlled knot experiment then we'll regard that as non-invasive and that way we'd be able to satisfy the requirements but there was one snag uh, which I should uh, mention straight away and that was that the experiments were done at finite temperature and magnetic field and therefore the ancilla was imperfectly initialized so we could if we thought we'd started with the electron spins up we could end up with the electron spin up and think that there had not been a control you know not been a spin flip but in fact if it had if we were wrong and it had started spin down then we would mistakenly have thought that that was a non-invasive measurement and we considered two possibilities one was that such effects averaged out randomly but the other one since we were trying to test foundational concepts in quantum theory was that actually there might be some mechanism that we hadn't identified that conspired to give the worst possible uh, correlations so we considered both cases and they're displayed here on, on these two diagrams the left hand case the blue one is uh, what we call the moderate realist and the right hand case um, the red one is what we call the aggressive realist and uh, the parameters are um, the, the horizontal axis is the amount by which we're trying to rotate the spin on the block sphere and the vertical axis is the, um, the this quantity F in the leggett garg inequality and then the, the forwards and backwards zeta is what we call the venality the susceptibility to corruption and um, the blue plane and the red plane show what you have to uh, do, achieve in order to uh, violate the leggett garg inequality and the transparent surface if you can imagine is the prediction of quantum theory and so what we've got to do in either case is to get below the red plane or the blue plane and then we have excluded macroscopic realism as defined uh, 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 for this purpose so here are the experimental data the left hand experiment is the first one we did the uh, it's a sort of section through the plane and the left hand one is a section through the plane at, at zeta is 0.25 and uh, you'll see that uh, uh, and the curve is the prediction of quantum theory and the dot is the experimental measurement in fact the black dot is the actual experimental measurement with its error the gray is corrected for known systematic errors and you'll see that in the left hand case we would um, violate the leggett garg inequality on the assumptions of moderate realism but we wouldn't satisfy this really stringent test of aggressive realism and then um, Stephanie Simmons who did the experiment worked out how to do it a bit better and uh, the right hand curve would violate the leggett garg inequality for both the, uh, the moderate realist and the aggressive realist so there is the uh, conjunction of the two beliefs and um, in that experiment we violated it by uh, 0.296 with a fidelity of 99% we later did a, a, a more detailed experiment where we violated it by uh, actually well 11.3 standard deviations if you uh, accept that the errors are random or 7.8 standard deviations even if you assume that there's some correlation between them 
And people have since done experiments. George Nee, who at the time was a student with me, has since been involved in an experiment where they've done it for really macroscopic systems for um, a flux qubit and violated it by 84 standard deviations. So we think that the techniques for violating the Leggett-Garg inequality are now well established, but we don't, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's the trouble with using someone else's computer. We don't know um, how, um, uh, it hasn't yet been extended to a, a large-scale system. That's still to be done. But the principles are there, so you could sort of push it out to bigger and bigger systems and say, how far can we go and still find that quantum theory holds? And um, most people think that it's probably a matter of getting a large enough checkbook. But it could be otherwise. When I talked to uh, Tony Leggett at his birthday party a couple of weeks ago, I said, if you were trying to choose the best place to look for quantum theory to cease working, where would be a good place to look? And uh, as we talked about it, he came up with the answer, well, it would be, it'd be good to look where life begins. And there's a relationship there to the, the role that information plays in the material world, because you can think of life beginning as, as an information management system emerging. And so maybe, you know, when what is otherwise just biological molecules, oh, oh, and sorry, uh, organic molecules that are described by, you know, bond orders and so on, begin to become a system that is managing information, maybe we'll see a breakdown there. I don't know. Uh, but we're beginning to establish the techniques that might enable us to look. So where else might you look for um, quantum theory as we currently use it to break down? You're going to have to look quite hard because quantum theory has been tested probably to greater precision than any other theory ever devised by the human mind. I don't know what it is, about 16 decimal places. Well. One other way that people have looked at this measurement problem, for those who recognize that there is a measurement problem, is uh, in collapse theories. And the first um, uh, collapse theory was, was um, the GRW theory, and then that was later modified by people like Philip Pearl. And they said, you know, maybe there are some regimes in which the wave function spontaneously collapses. Could you look for that? And you could. It would be very hard to do the experiments. And Phil Pearl came up with an idea that instead of looking for it directly, you could look indirectly for uh, secondary evidence of wave function collapse, and that would come through a heating effect. And uh, he was able to predict what the heating effect would be. And uh, we've done some calculations at Oxford as to what the uh, size of that heating effect might be in an iron trap experiment uh, to see whether or not there's, a, there's any hope of being able to detect it. So the, the novel idea here is to use an iron trap not to trap one iron of an atom, but to trap a small particle and you can discuss what size that small particle might be. And then you can calculate, according to the um, continuous spontaneous localization theory, what the heating rate would be, the energy raising rate. And it's given by this formula. Uh, chi is a, is a factor which probably is optimized with, at about two. Uh, that's Planck's constant, that's the density, so the best material to use would be osmium, and that's its mass. And now, um, these two parameters, lambda and r, are parameters that come into the theory. And we chose the values that were originally given by Giraldi, Rimini, and Weber. Okay, so they have these two, one's a time parameter, or a reciprocal time parameter, and the other's a length parameter. Nobody knows what those parameters should actually be. It's a guess, okay? 
So, but we put in the gases that have been used. And then we said, well, if we're going to detect the heating rate because of spontaneous uh, continuous spontaneous localization, we've got to make sure that we reduce all other sources of heating to something less than that. So what are the other sources of heating that there might be? Well, here are six contributions. And as we looked at it, we decided that the last three of those were going to be so small that we could forget about them. But the first three could be very significant indeed, so we'd better calculate them very carefully. And uh, we took uh, actual data, we took data from the, the best iron traps that are done in the world, the best iron trap experiments. We also actually, for mechanical vibrations, took data from the LIGO experiment because however expensive that might be, at least we know it has been physically realized. And uh, then we, 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 we thought, well, what would we need to be able to detect? Oh, and I'm sorry, this is the trouble with using someone else's computer. Um, we uh, detected that we would need to, that uh, the continuous spontaneous localization could give an energy raising rate of about um, 6 times 10 to the minus 33 watts and uh, turning that into practical um, uh, numbers in the laboratory it's, it's a question could you detect when we optimize all the parameters a temperature rise of 10 nanokelvin in a minute and a half or alternatively uh, 100 nanokelvin after a quarter of an hour and nobody's ever done that so it's more sensitive than anyone's ever done but it's not vastly more sensitive so it looks as if this kind of test of quantum foundations might actually become within reach if one worked quite hard at it it might be experimentally feasible now what other ways can we use advances in nanoscience to look at um, foundational concepts in physics? Well, uh, one of the things that we do a lot of in my laboratory is to measure how uh, electricity flows through a single uh, molecule. And it's a great privilege to have Professor Agre in the audience because he does uh, similar kinds of experiments, albeit with different techniques, in his laboratory at the... Uh, uh, at the um, the other university, I was going to say, the Autonomous University in Madrid. Uh, the sort of way that we do it is we um, take a ribbon of graphene and uh, we create a nano gap in the ribbon. The nano gap is about one or two nanometers wide and that's chosen to be about the width of a molecule. And then what we do is we, take, we, we choose the molecule we want to study and we tend to engineer molecules that show significant quantum phenomena like quantum resonances, Fano resonances, um, quantum interference effects. And then we attach, as it were, two sticky notes to the molecule so that when we introduce the molecule, it then one sticky note attaches to each side of the nano gap and we can see how the electricity flows through the molecule. And we can actually see what we're doing with um, extraordinary resolution. The advances in transmission electron microscopy in the last 10 years have been absolutely fantastic. <coughs> so now this is a, a, an edge of a piece of graphene and the uh, separation between the atoms in graphene is about 142 picometers and you're seeing them there with a resolution of about 80 picometers and actually a sensitivity to change in separation of about 5 picometers. So the angstrom unit has long become obsolete. We're going much smaller than that with microscopy nowadays. And we can see how electricity interacts, for example, with vibrational modes of a, a molecule. So uh, I put this slide in because Professor Agre and I were talking about this earlier this morning. Uh, the movie there is of a uh, molecular dynamics calculation by a, a, a someone, Professor Gray and I both work with, Colin Lambert, and it's um, simulating one of the vibrational modes of a fullerene molecule in a nano gap. Now, the way that we tend to um, collect data here is we often uh, plot it as a charge stability diagram 
So if you can imagine the uh, bias voltage between the source and the drain electrodes of the graphene is plotted on this vertical axis here in millivolts. And then the gate voltage, uh, so we have, a, what? <coughs> we have a nearby gate so that we can alter the energy of the um, uh, molecule. And that's plotted as this horizontal axis. And then uh, for the brightness here, we plot the current through, or in this particular case, the differential conductance through the molecule. And um, if, if with the molecule is just acting like a sort of blob with a capacitance, then we get what are called Coulomb diamonds in the charge stability diagram. These are very familiar to anyone who's worked with this. And in particular, the two Coulomb diamonds cross in a sort of X shape like that. What you see here is it's much, much more interesting and much richer. And we have these lines within the regions of conductance. And those uh, lines, those stripes, correspond to known vibrational modes of the fullerene molecule. And uh, you also see that a sort of a, um, oh, I'm sorry, this borrowed computer is not working again. Um, you also see that there's a gap that's opened up in the um, Coulomb, between the Coulomb diamonds, and that corresponds to uh, actual displacements of the fullerene molecule as a result of one extra electron going on. Let me see if I can get this computer to work. No, it isn't working. Never mind. Um, so we've got um, one extra electron uh, going onto the uh, molecule. And as it does that, the molecule to, can displace to one side. And if it displaces by an amount greater than the spatial extent of the um, vibrational mode of the wave function uh, 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 of the molecule in its ground state, then th there isn't enough overlap of the wave functions for the transition to occur. And this is called a Frank Condon blockade. And so this gap that's opened up here is a Frank Condon blockade gap that corresponds to the, to the displacement of the molecule as a result of one extra electron going onto it. I find it absolutely amazing that we can detect these effects in the laboratory. Of course, the uh, energies are small, and so we cool it down. And these experiments are typically done at 20 millikelvin which is colder than any known place in the universe outside a human laboratory. Now, we can do those experiments with vibrating molecules, but molecules are not the only things uh, that we can vibrate in the laboratory. So, um, uh, this is uh, a picture which my, one of my Spanish friends has kindly translated the caption for me. I hope it reads, the world's smallest guitar string and uh, the guitar string is a nanotube. So here is the nanotube suspended between two electrodes. There's a scale bar for you. The diameter of the nanotube, well, if you took 50,000 of them and put them side by side, you'd have something in the diameter of one of the hairs on your head. And uh, we can measure the uh, displacement of that nanotube with extraordinary precision. Uh, this is the uh, sort of dilution fridge we do it in. That's Natalia Ares, who happens to be a Spanish-speaking, very, very brilliant scientist in the laboratory. I hope she'll come and visit you one day. She can give you a talk in Spanish. And uh, the technique that she's uh, developed for measuring the vibration of the nanotube is to have some sort of cavity resonator, which could be literally a cavity, or it could be a lumped element circuit that behaves like a cavity. And the trick is to have the, uh, or the, the trick that she developed was to have the frequency of this resonant circuit close to the actual mechanical resonant frequency of the nanotube. And by doing that, she achieved sensitivity much higher than had ever previously been achieved. Uh, and I'll give you some numbers in a moment. But let me first of all show you one, two uh, 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 results. This is, again, it's a charge stability diagram. 
Uh, no, it's not. It's not a charged Phillips diagram. I beg your pardon. The, the uh, axis here is again the gate voltage, so it's the voltage of this gate here. And you can think of that as doing two things. One is it's tuning up the guitar string, so it can change the frequency of the vibration. But the other thing is it can change the number of electrons on the nanotube. And then this axis here is, um, is uh, frequency. And, and this is a sort of conductance of the nanotube. It's actually S31 in a, in a network analyzer, if you're familiar with this kind of measurement. And each of these corresponds to one more electron going onto the nanotube. And you can see the change of frequency as that happens. And in particular, these sharp uh, bits down here are uh, what would be called a bright Wigner resonance. And I find it absolutely amazing that <laughs> what we're doing in that experiment is as it dips down, you're actually observing the change in frequency and therefore the change in stiffness of the nanotube corresponding to the stiffness of the wave function of a single electron. It's absolutely amazing to have sensitivity to that. And now we can begin to see how we can get close to really measuring foundational quantum phenomena. Uh, up here, you've got progress in nanotechnology for looking at vibrating objects. And on the scale going up there, Natalia has drawn the uh, magnitude of the quantum zero-point motion. And the smaller you get and the higher frequency object you get, the smaller is the um, quantum zero point motion. So for this nanotube, the sort of thing that we're measuring there, it's about a picometer. And the uh, sensitivity that we've got to the displacement of that through this um, cavity resonant experiment is, well, it's already got to a sensitivity better than 0.1 picometer per root hertz. So we're getting, and, 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 and um, actually this week they're installing something that's going to improve that still further. So what we're doing is we're getting to the point where measurements of the quantum zero-point motion of these sort of objects is again, it's coming within reach. And I think soon we'll be doing it. So what kinds of experiments would we be able to detect with those sort of things? Well, I've given you two what places to look if you want quantum, you know, if you say where might quantum theory break down. Let me give you a third place to look, and that is this. That nobody knows how to reconcile quantum theory with general relativity and gravity. And uh, it's, it's, I suppose it was the great sort of unsolved problem at the end of 20th century physics with all the fantastic advances that had been made. How do you reconcile and unify these two theories which were, I suppose, in some ways the great achievements of physics in the 20th century, at least the great changes in, in the way people think. And um, often people think, well, you, you know, you're going to have to get to Planck times and Planck scales and so on. And the trouble is that Planck times and Planck scales have got so many numbers in the negative exponent that you've got to go to the earliest stage of the universe or something to have a hope of looking at them. What's changing is that people are beginning to get ideas for how you might do these experiments in laboratory scale experiments. So you don't need a black hole in order to be able to get Planck lengths and Planck times. There are experiments you can imagine doing in the laboratory. And there's a family of such ideas that are coming up theoretically. One family of ideas is basically this, that you take uh, two massive objects, one here and one here, but when I say massive, I mean laboratory scale massive objects, and you let them fall freely, and then you create a sort of chicane whereby they come together and then they go apart again. If, as they come together, the interaction between them, the gravitational interaction, is quantum, then you should be able to create entanglement between them. 
And then, after they've separated, you ought to be able to detect that entanglement through a standard test of Abel inequality. So, people are beginning to devise families of experiments that are of that nature. We've been thinking of a different way of detecting quantum gravity, which is uh, uh, based on uh, an information theoretic view of gravity. So what we're now saying is um, we've got uh, two objects and we've got a channel of information that goes between, between them. The channel itself could be classical or it could be quantum. And you can think what the channel of information is, it's the distortion of space-time. And so, um, if we've got an object here and another one there, and this one is distorting space-time, this one, as it were, makes a measurement of that one through the distortion. Just as continuous spontaneous localization can be de detected indirectly through a heating effect, so this gravitational effect could be detected by a heating effect if it is classical. But if it is quantum, there won't be a heating effect. So let me show you uh, what I mean by that. So um, here's, the, here's the system here. And uh, you've got two objects and some interaction between them. And if the interaction between them is quantum, then it's one giant size quantum system and there won't be any heating. All right. But if the interaction between them is classical, then that could produce a heating effect, which you ought to be able to measure. Now, um, the sort of way we might look for this is in cavities where we, we have a membrane, and in this case it is, uh, it's not a lumped element cavity, it's, it's, it really is a, a box, it's an aluminium box, okay, um, with an antenna in it, and we put the membrane in. And now, let me just summarize some of the key steps in the calculation. I won't go through this in detail, um, but you write down a Hamiltonian for the whole system, including, you know, a Hamiltonian for the interaction between the objects. And now you suppose that there's some measurement going on, as I say, through the distortion of space-time. And uh, what the key step here is this, that we'd originally thought of doing an experiment with two membranes and the interaction between them. And in fact, if you put the numbers in, it, you, you could do the experiment. But it's very challenging to set it up because the two membranes need to have a significant size, laterally, but they need to be spaced uh, a few nanometers apart with nanometer precision and nanometer parallelism and so on. It's quite difficult to think how you'd actually make that and adjust it and so on. And the key step was to realize that actually you don't need two membranes, you only need one, because you can have the self interaction if they're crystalline, you can have the self-interaction of, of one atom in this membrane with other neighboring atoms. And now it works out rather nicely because these are dipole interactions, so you get a term here which has uh, got a, a d to the sixth on the bottom line, it's the same reason why van der Waals forces have a 1 over r to the 6th power law in them. And uh, so that falls off very rapidly with distance, you don't need to sum for very far. And if it's a crystalline lattice, then either all the masses are the same, or there's a regular pattern of masses. So that makes this summation tractable, and we're going to use this parameter s to describe that interaction. And now there's another important thing to notice, which is we have this uh, measurement rate, gamma, and we don't actually know what that is. You know, how often does this mass here sense the distortion of space-time because of that mass there? So, what gamma is, is a complete guess. But you can rather quickly see, using high school um, calculus, that there'll be some m minimum heating rate. You can minimize it, and you minimize it when gamma naught's got that value there. And that enables us to work out a minimum heating rate. And the really amazing thing about this equation here, I hope you're as amazed as I am, it's an equation with h-bar and big G in the same equation. And now we can put some numbers in, and we can calculate that, the, and I'm sorry again, this is the problem of using a different computer, that the uh, minimum heating rate 
would be uh, 1.2 times, this is for parameters in our laboratory, 1.2 times 10 to the minus 41 watts. And that's hopeless, okay? We're never going to measure a heating rate of that size. At least it puts a bound on it, helps us to decide whether or not to do the experiment. But please remember, please remember that actually we have no idea what gamma naught should be. So this is a minimum heating rate, but if gamma naught is some very different value from that, then the actual heating rate could be bigger, and we just don't know how much bigger. The final um, topic that I wanted to turn to before I conclude, and this is something that um, uh, Professor Perondo and I are very keen to explore together, is the new kind of thermodynamics that you can get on the nanoscale. Now, one embarks on experiments in thermodynamics with a great deal of hesitation. This was Sir Arthur Eddington giving the Gifford Lectures in Edinburgh in 1927. And he said, the law that entropy always increases holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. If someone points out to you that your pet theory of the universe is in disagreement with Maxwell's equations, then so much the worse for Maxwell's equations. If it's found to be contradicted by experiments, well, these experimentalists do bungle things sometimes. But if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can offer you no hope. There is nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. <laughs> so we challenge these uh, concepts of um, uh, thermodynamics with some hesitation. Nevertheless, there are good reasons for thinking that on the nanoscale, thermodynamics may be rather different from what it is on the macroscopic scale. And um, various people like Chris Drozinski and so on have shown that uh, as you get smaller and smaller, the fluctuations which all get smoothed out on the macroscopic scale, the fluctuations become significant and that leads to what uh, at first sight might be a, a rather surprising result, which is that the inequalities that we associate with the second law of thermodynamics might turn into equalities. Let me illustrate that. Um, here are some of the things that you, could, uh, you might be able to test on the um, nanoscale. And again, I apologize. Apparently, it's for the streaming. I was asked to use a different computer, and it scrambled all the equations up, so I'm sorry about that. Um, but I hope you can make sense of them anyway. Um, what could you test uh, on the nanoscale? Well, one of the things you can test is um, the relationship between uh, information and energy. And this is uh, a line of thought that was first stimulated by uh, James Clerk Maxwell in the 19th century when he devised an experiment that Lord Kelvin later dubbed as Maxwell's demon. And it seemed that you could have, by having a demon that observed things, sort uh, a random uh, mixture of gases into hot gases on one side and cold molecules on the other side and thereby create uh, a heat engine without apparently needing to put any work in. And the answer, uh, which is now well known, is that the very observation that the Maxwell demon needed to make uh, required some entropy and the, the energy associated with that energy uh, with that observation is kt log 2 and Zillard then devised an engine where you could turn one bit of information into kt log 2 of work and the, the, the corollary of that was, was worked out by Rolf Landauer that the erasure or the resetting of one bit of information caused uh, an inevitable dissipation of heat, not less than kT log 2. So these are things you might be able to test and implement. Then uh, the Jarzinski inequality, which, which this computer has messed up, I'm sorry, uh, is taking what was uh, an inequality, namely that, well, one way of expressing the, third, the, the second law is that the, the, uh, the work you put in uh, is greater than or equal to the change in the free energy that you create. 
and that turns, if you can imagine, those are exponentials into um, an equality of averages if you go to a really small system. And that has all sorts of foundational implications. Uh, one of them is, of course, you know, how do we think about the arrow of time? You know, you take a glass, you drop it on the floor, it smashes, the entropy is increased. So the entropy later is greater than the entropy earlier. So we've already got a before and after, an earlier, later kind of uh, asymmetry in time. But if that's replaced by an equality, then it makes you wonder what happens to the uh, arrow of time. And again, we're going back to that puzzle that Tony Leggett raised in the context of quantum theory, which is this mismatch of our experience of our us-sized lives compared with what we know and have great confidence about in the quantum scale. And so the third question there is, could you extend these to the quantum regime? And I put in one slide here, just because we were talking about it uh, earlier on this morning, uh, people have been doing experiments of some of these ideas for some time now. Uh, this was one experiment that we happened to be discussing this morning, where um, <coughs> uh, uh, Kosky and others have done, made a Zillard engine with a single electron. So what they're trying to do is to um, put in one bit of information and get out KT log 2 of work. And the, the experiment sort of approaches that, and the really nice thing is you can see that as they tune up all the parameters and, and vary them, then at uh, best, the amount of heat is actually minus log 2 there, okay, times KT. So, so they're getting into this KT log 2 quantity has to be said that, that what they're measuring there is a rather sort of indirect quantity, so it's not as close uh, as we would like to being a direct measurement, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And so the, 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 the real um, sort of open-ended question that I want to leave you with now, and then I'll, I'll, I'll just make some concluding remarks, is um, <coughs> how we might uh, really uh, explore thermodynamics on the nanoscale. So here's a scheme that uh, we were drawing on the whiteboard this morning. So conventional thermodynamics, as you know, was, was developed to, to answer questions like how efficient can a steam engine be? And um, that became very well established in the 19th century. So you can think of that as this sort of scheme here. This is the piston of the steam engine here. This is the boiler here, heating it up, producing smoke, though this is mainly steam, of course. And the battery is the, the, the mechanical system driving the train along and, and doing work. But now I want to, to change the sign, so I want to have it so that when we have uh, work going from the battery to the system, that's a positive number. And similarly, when there's um, heat going from the cylinders to the uh, heat bath, that's also a positive number. And now, rather importantly, we can measure both of those. We can measure the state of this system, and we can measure the amount of uh, energy in the battery. But now, we take this rather macroscopic system and we turn it into a nanoscale system. And it's a nanoscale system that, in fact, uh, we're going to say it's a two-level system. So our, our system is so small that there's only two states it can be in. It can be in the ground state or the excited state. And uh, we've got some sort of system here whose energy we can measure. And crucially, the transfer between the battery and the system is reversible. It's fully deterministic. And then <coughs> over here, we've got a system which could be thermal, but it could be electromagnetic. And crucially, this transfer has some randomness in it. So it's not deterministic and it's not reversible. And again, we can measure the battery and we can measure the two-level system. And we can also change the energy levels in the two-level system. So then we end up with <coughs> our ability to 
to implement something with these kind of ni vibrating nanotubes that I was showing you earlier. And so the, the two-level system, well, there's a choice. You know, it could be an electron spin up or spin down, or it could be an electron there or not there, or it could be an electron here or there. We can uh, have our, our uh, battery is the mechanical motion of the nanotube, and depending on the mechanical position of the nanotube, the energy level spacings can change, and we can make measurements with that kind of cavity uh, system that I was showing you earlier on. So we're now in a position, uh, on the, the, the electromagnetic reservoir, I should say, is just these leads here. We don't know how many electrons there are in there, and we don't know what their energy is. So now we're getting a sort of position where we've got this as a system in the laboratory that we can use for testing some of these nanoscale concepts. Now, this can have uh, implications for foundations of physics. It might also have some technological applications. Uh, I don't know of any technology that is less that is further from its thermodynamic limit of energy consumption than quantum, uh, the, the, I beg your pardon, than information processing. So uh, here are the numbers you may know, and, and uh, again, a colleague has been kind enough to t turn these into uh, Spanish for you, that the um, uh, global consumption of uh, energy is about a thousand terawatt hours per year. And of that, about 5% is used uh, for, I'm sorry, I've got, uh, I, I beg your pardon, um, it's, it's, <coughs> it's, it's, it's 20,000 million megawatt hours per year, okay, is the global consumption of electricity. And about 10% of that, so about 1,000 million megawatt hours per year, is used for information and communication technologies. And it, it divides about a third, about a third, about a third. So about a third is for end-user devices like this one here, and your desktop computer and computers in banks and so on. About a third is for the telecoms infrastructure, you know, the mast by the roadside to operate your cellular telephone. And about a third is the newest and fastest growing one, which is the cloud, the Amazon, the Google, the big data farms. And uh, the consumption is uh, vastly greater than is actually needed. And I'm sorry, again, this computer's messed up the slide, but um, live with it. Um, the thermodynamic limit is the bottom number there. So at room temperature, KT log 2 is 3 zeptojoules, 3 times uh, 10 to the minus 21 joules. This computer, for each Boolean operation, actually uses about a femtojoule. So does your iPhone, so do the big data farms. So they're using about 300,000 times the uh, thermodynamically required energy consumption, even for irreversible computing, let alone for reversible computing. I don't suppose that we're very quickly going to get down to the thermodynamic limit. There are good reasons why it's going to be hard. There are very good reasons why nobody has done better with silicon CMOS, despite years of effort. There's a fundamental limit which is, um, which is not far off what they currently achieve. I could explain that to you in answer to a question, if you like. But what this does make clear is there's plenty of room for improvement. And you'd need an awful lot of solar panels and wind farms and so on to make up that electricity that at the moment we're just wasting. And in fact, about half of it is unnecessary heat dissipation in the computers, and about the other half is the cooling systems for the big computer systems, where the cooling usually uses about as much electricity as the computer itself uses. The last thing that I'll mention to you because I'm talking about prospects for changes, is something we're very excited about in our laboratory and we're already implementing, and that is um, using machine learning to automate the choice of experiments. Uh, it's my conviction that 
very soon machine learning will be universal in laboratories just as computers are already universal for controlling apparatus and logging data. Nobody uses analog chart recorders anymore. Not many of the instruments in my laboratory have a knob on them. Mostly someone sits at the computer giving the instructions to the experiment. So just as the computers are now pretty universal in the laboratory, so I think machine learning soon will be. And the, the particular uh, type of machine learning that will become really powerful for um, choosing what the next experiment should be is Bayesian optimization. And here's a little cartoon of how Bayesian optimization works. Uh, Bayesian optimization is good when you have a belief but the belief is shrouded in uncertainty. And the belief could be a belief about who will win the next election in your country, but it could be a belief about uh, the, a, a mathematical function that describes the device that you've got in your cryostat. You're going to reduce the uncertainty by getting new data. But the data are costly to acquire if it's for an opinion poll, you know, doing opinion polls of public opinion are expensive. If it's in our laboratory, you might say, well, one measurement in the laboratory doesn't cost very much, but it does actually. And anyway, it's not one measurement, it's a million measurements or 10 million measurements. And uh, there's a cost not only in finance, which you have to get grants for, but there's also a cost in the time of the experimenter and the use of the equipment. So you want to choose the next measurement that will do you the most good in reducing the uncertainty and improving the accuracy of your belief. So here's a little cartoon. We initially train the machine using simulations. And then the machine for a particular device we've got in the laboratory has some prediction. Let's suppose that it's only one parameter. In practice, of course, it's generally many more than one parameter that we can control, and it's one parameter that we measure. And the dotted line there, that's our belief of the function that describes our system. But the, 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 the broad ribbon indicates and represents our uncertainty. And what the machine then does, and this has been the breakthrough in the last two years, is cheap computationally fast ways of finding the maximum in what's called the acquisition function. The acquisition function is a measure of how much good data at that parameter will do you. So in this particular case, the machine looks at this, it looks at the uncertainty, and it says, there, that's where the acquisition function is a maximum. If you could make a measurement there, that'll do you more good than a measurement anywhere else. So it's made that calculation, and there we make the next measurement there. So now the uncertainty at this point is greatly reduced. So now it will calculate a new acquisition function, and it says, well, in the light of all this, you need to make a measurement there. So now the machine makes the next measure, finds the maximum the acquisition function is here, and that's where the next measurement is. And this is the process of Bayesian optimization, and I can show you, are you standing up because it's time to stop? <laughs> this is the last slide of results, okay? Um, this is uh, data from a couple of weeks ago in our laboratory, and it's another stability diagram, and the machine had already been trained, and then it made, um, uh, uh, I think, 64 measurements on a grid like that. And from those 64 measurements, it said, well, look, here are some possible scenarios for the uh, stability diagram that those 64 measurements might correspond to. And then it, it finds the maximum acquisition function. Crudely, you can say, well, if I measure there, it's very different in this prediction from that prediction. So that's where the greatest uncertainty is. Actually, it's a more sophisticated method than this. So now it makes measurements here and it makes the measurements there and there and now it predicts a new set of candidate stability diagrams and now again it says where is the maximum in the acquisition function so it makes some new measurements 
But now, even with 1,024 measurements, it can predict these, which are not far off from the eventual one. And it goes through the process again until eventually it makes a complete measurement of all the points. And, and this is what, you know, a, a graduate student in the lab would have measured in the first place with 16,000 measurements. And what we're uh, evaluating now is how well the machine can do with a greatly reduced number of measurements. And one of the other things we're doing is we've, we've now got a multiplexer, cryogenic multiplexer, so we can load 1,024 devices into the cryostat in one go. And the first thing the machine does is to work out which of those are good samples to spend some time measuring in more detail. And <coughs> this is going to transform the way that experiments are done in the laboratory. It's greatly going to accelerate discovery. Uh, but it also raises some pretty um, foundational questions. And so now I go back to these sort of foundational questions that we started to think about. Um, you can ask of this machine, could a machine make a scientific discovery? Uh, can a machine manifest agency or imagination or creativity or belief or surprise or curiosity? And that's actually not a random list. Uh, about each of those, there's quite a lot that we could say. And so back now to the <coughs> question that uh, you know, I presented when I was introducing Sir Anthony Leggett and his ideas. Um, is the reality there when nobody looks? And you'll pick up uh, that from a quotation from uh, Albert Einstein to Abraham Pace when they were discussing quantum reality. And Einstein asked Pace, is the moon there when nobody looks? And so you can think of these foundational questions. Why do we care about reality? Is mathematics reality? Is the mind the starting point of our experience? Are our lives in harmony with reality? Perhaps that's the most important question anybody could ever ask of themselves. And uh, we've tried to address some of those questions in the book there. stock from experiments to philosophy or, and uh, we have time for a few questions if uh, anybody then I will I will start with a question that uh, about the, the first part the legged guard uh, inequality that uh, okay we are more familiar with Bell inequality yes. that uh, precludes the or I mean it's a test of local realism could you explain a bit uh, the differences, or what the, like, this legged gark inequality tells us that the Bell inequality uh, doesn't tell us. The, the legged gark inequality is sometimes given the nickname of a Bell's inequality in time. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's only approximate. It's not an exact correspondence between the Bell inequality, but it is true that the, I mean, what the Bell inequality uh, well, what does it really show? It shows lots and lots of things, actually, but it provided a way of testing the assertion that Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen implied in their 1935 paper that quantum mechanics is incomplete. And that paper was published in 1935. Um, it became, it's now known as the EPR paper, and um, for the first 20 or 25 years, it had only about five citations. Shows that these citation metrics are not very accurate. And um, nobody could see how to test it. And the first step in seeing how to test it was John Bell producing his inequality, which of course can test more than just the EPR paradox, but it can test that, it provides a way. And then it took another 10 years before people like Alan Aspey and so on had the equipment that enabled them to do the experiments. And uh, you cannot, you cannot, once you've seen the results of those experiments, believe in local realism. It's ruled out by such experiments. Tony Leggett was interested in a different question about realism. And he was really interested in this question of the 
almost these, the sort of intellectual inconsistency which, which those of us who live in, you know, who do quantum technology experiments like I do, we, we live in a, an intellectually inconsistent way because our everyday experience is, is not quantum. It, we, we don't live in quantum superpositions, that's not how we live our lives. And yet, we, we, we're absolutely confident of the quantum theory working on the, exper you know, in the experiments in the laboratory. How do we address that? And so this, this was um, uh, the, the purpose of the inequality was to say, can we find or can we rule out macroscopic realism in bigger and bigger systems? Can we test for it? Um, and it's all tied in with the measurement problem, which doesn't really come into the Bell's inequality test of the uh, EPR calculation. I, sh I should emphasize, uh, people often equate Bell inequality with EPR. The Bell inequality is just a mathematical result. It's a mathematical tool that happens to be very useful for testing the EPR um, uh, um, problem, paradox, whatever you like to call it, the EPR phenomenon, uh, which itself is a test of quantum entanglement and therefore of non-local realism. So they're really testing for very different things. Okay. Any further question? Could you please say a bit more about the measurement of quantum of zero point motion? Because these things have been debated, and I remember 20 years ago, some people claimed that they have measured it. And, but then many people say that the zero point motion is fundamentally unobservable. You, I mean, you can have, a, well, in the sense that you know it's there, and you touch it, and then it's not a zero point motion anyway anymore because you have excited it. So. How can you go around this uh, difficulty? Um, I, I don't know what the fund. I mean, I mean, I think measuring zero point motion is just a question of the the quality of the technology in your laboratory. Okay, I I, I didn't use any conceptual difficulty in measuring it. Just as there's no conceptual difficulty in measuring Brownian motion. And we think we, we, we will actually, the Brownian motion in this is much bigger than the quantum zero point motion, even at 20 millikelvin. So we think we're, we'll be able to measure both of those. Um, and uh, it's just a matter of getting a sensitive enough system. Now, of course, of course, <laughs> once we get good enough to be able to do that, we'll need to be able to think about the back action. And so the, that, that will become an important problem. I hope it will become an important problem for us very soon. Okay. Any other question? If not, let's thank uh, Andrew again. And <laughs> the gracias a todos por venir y gracias a la facultad por organizar esta charla.